Hello everybody, AJ here for the Mighty Glue Stick channel and this is a Monster Ecology video on the Minotaur. Now thanks to a request I get to bring you both. The Minotaur is both a savage, humanoid eating monsters that they are, and also the more civilized player character variant that they are. Here's the thing, both are equally valid. Both can exist in the same campaign world and really the Minotaur has always had this dual nature to it as a creature in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, one of the first monsters to appear in Dungeons and Dragons with the white box set back in 1974 in first edition, uh, the Dragonlance setting featured Minotaurs of the world of Kryn as a playable race, and they featured in many Dragonlance setting materials later, but yes, they have always been a playable race since 1985. I emphasize this to head the old school monsters should stay monsters players out there, because I can just imagine me your knuckles whitening in anticipation of venting your views on playable minotaurs. So ha! They are monsters and player characters. They always have been. Deal with it. Okay, as monsters, they are based, uh, they have their roots based in the mythology. And yes, they eat people. All minotaurs are carnivores. They eat meat. And they have very sharp fangs of meat eaters. The monstrous variety also love mazes. They have a humanoid body. Um, of a professional wrestler proportions and larger even and they have a head that is the proportions of a bull and they have cloven feet there are some variations in how close to bull the head looks and what fine details of their feet and hands are like or they have a short tail like a bull tail but no or no tail it's it really depends on the artwork and things and practically whether they have a short tail or not is not very important in 5th edition Monster Manual, we see that these monstrous minotaurs have high strength and constitution, average dexterity and charisma, low intelligence, but an unusually high wisdom, indicating that their memory of mazes and their basically their high level of predatory cunning. The descriptive text states that they have no time for strategy or tactics. So with their chaotic evil alignment and distaste for organization, this means uh, it seems to fit a mind that runs largely on instinct, swift to react to expected situations, but very slow to predict what will happen in situations they haven't experienced before. So savage minotaurs are slow learners, but very cunning, and they prefer to hunt by ambush and then brutal violence. Their slow wits do not include their ability to navigate, which is famously excellent, and they take full advantage of this trait by seeking areas that twist, turn, and feature a lot of dead ends. This can include dungeons, ruins, forest, rock formations, and even crowded city alleyways. Also, um, when we start talking about the playable uh, character race of Minotaurs, you'll understand how this knack for the navigation makes them a natural for the environment that I'm going to describe. Uh, because later on in this video, I'm going to tell you how you can fit them into your uh, Forgotten Realms campaign setting quite easily. They have dark vision out to 60 feet and a high passive perception of 17. And they are characteristically berserk in their fighting methods as the scent of blood and the sight of gore sends them into a frenzy just as much as getting sliced or chopped by their enemies does. With an armor class of 14, hit points ranging from 36 to 117, the ability to gain advantage on all attacks while at the same time getting disadvantages on defenses, the Minotaur is a dangerous foe and their gore attack if they have at least a 10 foot run up to a target, is plus 6 to hit and does 8 to 36 damage with a DC 14 strength save from the target or it gets thrown on its ass 10 feet from where it was standing, not prone. I imagine the Minotaur will then power into the next attack uh, or if it has a clear gap, leap the distance, go into a reckless mode and proceed to wail on the prone, prone target with its great axe, striking with advantage and doing 6 to 28 damage every swing of that thing until that target is turned into a pile of bite-sized chunks. Minotaurs are also pretty fast with a base speed of 40 feet. They can run down most humanoids and can run for quite a long time before slowing down thanks to their high constitution. The second half of the descriptive text in the Monster Manual talks about the cult of the Horned King and the rituals of the cultists that gradually transform them into Minotaurs. Uh, all under the influence of Baphomet, the Horned King, demon prince of the, prince of the Great Maze in the Abyss. We will be talking much, much more uh, later in this ecology about that, but let's take a look at the civilized playable race of Minotaurs and where they come into the picture. Minotaurs, even the, the ones created with transformative rituals, breed true, meaning that two Minotaurs will have a Minotaur uh, calves, not babies of whatever they race they were before they became Minotaurs. So two cultists of a completely separate species 
uh, who became minotaurs thanks to their foul rites would have minotaur babies with each other. The offspring will most likely end up being savage hunters themselves, but not always, and they can sometimes control their urges and bloodlust uh, and become calmer, more patient, more tolerant, and less chaotic individuals and pass these traits into their own offspring. They can be civilized, and it's these guys which I'm about to talk to you about now. One more note on the savage minotaurs, uh, that they... They are infused with demonic energy, particularly the first generation cultist minotaurs. They are devoted to Baphomet, um, although they basically are duped. And and this transformation is almost unwitting and unwilling, but it's inevitable once they've passed point uh, beyond a certain point. It's one of those cults where um, it seems like fun and games at, at the time. The Stark Secret of Cult of Violence and uh, engaging their predatory nature. So the the goal of the cultists, it's almost like a druid circle with a more savage bent to it. So they start worshipping the more primal area of nature and and drawing on that primal power. It's like one of those scr- primal screen workshops, right? Where they're tapping into a raw, the raw nature inside themselves and it gets twisted and it turns into a gateway which allows Baphomet to influence them and infuse demonic energy into them, which creates this transformative process in a series of foul rites involving cannibalism. Anyway, so the the demonic aspect of the savage minotaurs is enhanced, and uh, that's one of the things that really separates them from the more civilized minotaurs. You can tell when you're dealing with a minotaur which has got demonic energy inside it. It's chaotic. It's uh, mercurial, it's got a lot of bloodlust, and it's it's relentless. And one of the biological aspects of being a large meat eater, if you look at lions and bears and all sorts of other creatures that eat meat, they spend a lot of their time resting and, and relaxing and sleeping because the, the, the it takes a lot of metabolism to be a, a, a high, high apex predator. And meat is one of those things where you chase stuff down and catch it, or maybe not. Minotaurs would be the same sort of way. And one of the downsides of being a meat eater and being constantly active is that you need to keep up your metabolism, you need to keep your body, your your, your muscles pumping at the sacrifice of nutrition going to your brain. So that's that kind of explains the savage minotaurs being chaotic and not very smart because they have a lot of instinct, they've got a lot of hunting prowess, but they don't have a lot of uh, spare nutrition to keep their brain pumping. So their intelligence is consequently low. Now, if we get to... Oh, also, they grow. They can grow much larger than uh, than civilized minotaurs. So on average, the, the wild minotaurs are big, monstrous um, behemoths behemoths whereas the civilized minotaurs are leaner smaller um they are yeah they're more athletic in their outlook so what are the stats of your excuse me well i i've just got back from work so i need to fish in i was actually doing some homework at work on this uh there's actually been some really good articles um on this in uh, Dragon Magazine 116, they talk about the uh, the monstrous minotaur. Um, and in Dragon 369, minotaurs is a playable race for 4th edition. Now, the 4th edition minotaurs, I don't personally like them very much because they were too powerful. They were 7 foot 5, 350 pounds, had plus 2 to strength, plus 2 to constitution. Um, and although they got the speed right, 6 squares, um, their vision was not... Uh, they didn't have dark vision, and yeah, they just uh, they didn't quite hit the mark as far as I'm concerned. The original Minotaurs, the original playable Minotaurs from the Dragonlance setting, the world of Kryn, are actually much more applicable to the 5th edition, and the Unearthed Arcana um, released a version of them for 5th edition, which I think got it bang on. Apart from one thing, I, th- I think they still should have their speed um, of 60 feet per round. But essentially, um, you get to you get a little bit of variation in, in how you choose to make your how to play your minotaur, and their society really makes sense to me, um, both socially and biologically, and also um, just the convenience of how you can slip it into uh, the Forgotten Realms. They are a island 
island race. So they, they live on islands. So imagine that some of these cultists got away, um, and their, or their offspring of these cultists got away from Kryn, got away from uh, the Forgotten Realms cult in whatever, maybe they're on the Sword Coast or Corm, uh, Cormier or some other ancient empire. And they escaped to an island. And there they learned how to fish because fish is a potent source of readily available protein. Now, carnivores who eat a lot of fish tend to be um, le- more active and smart, um, generally. I mean, look at human beings where we eat a lot of meat. We, we also um, have evolved eating a lot of fish. Um, it's surmised. And uh, our dentition is certainly good. And I, I've seen firsthand that feeding fish to animals uh, tends to make them very robust and healthy. And I myself ate a lot of fish when I grew up. And look at me now. Anyway, okay, so the Minotaurs of Kryn. Uh, what is their society? Their society is embrace, embraces the notion that the weak should perish and that the strong must rule. Minotaurs are naturally very big and very strong. It makes sense to them that they're a, a superior species because they look at smaller humanoids and all they see is prey, basically. Although they have switched to a different form of meat source, um, they... The instinct to eat humanoids still lingers in the mind of every minotaur. Now, you've got to keep this in mind when you're playing a minotaur, that they don't see anything particularly wrong with eating other humanoids. It's 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 a curse of that, you know, that demonic influence that, that bore their race. Um, yeah, there is a touch of evil inside them. Uh, and it's it's something that they war against every day. A good example of that sort of conflict is the character Worf from Star Trek The Next Generation. He is a Klingon who lives in a very uh, civilized society. And Klingon society uh, is rough by the the social mores of the Federation. They eat raw food, you know, they eat living food. And uh, there's a lot of combat and murder. Um, Or it seems very chaotic, but it's actually very lawful. And uh, that's that kind of mimics where the Minotaurs are coming from, um, much like uh, other races of, like, say, the um, the Goliath are very competition based. Um, so too are the Minotaurs, but it takes a different bent. Uh, leadership of the Minotaur uh, species, their society, is determined by their placing in combat arenas. They center their life, much like ancient Rome, around the circus, the arena. And combat, ritual combat, forms a pivotal point of various stages of their life, which tr- uh, transition them from a child into an adult, uh, and also establish their dominance in leadership roles in all aspects of their society. Uh, males and females all combat each other. Now, this also, uh, they, they have a fairly low population in the Forgotten Realms and also in Kryn, and uh, this this constant combat and testing themselves and uh, proving themselves uh, worthy is it's lethal so it actually wipes out a, a fair chunk of the population and as a consequence they uh, they gradually are improving and, and refining themselves slipping further away from their savage nature and more to a lawful um, society unfortunately it's, it tends to be lawful evil but it's still a functional society, much like the hobgoblins, lawful evil can actually work in a totalitarian state. Their society is built on a principle that might makes right. It is led by an emperor who is served by a council of eight minotaurs called the Supreme Circle. This is actually um, a reflection of the um, eight council of eight pit fiends in the, um, the Nine Hells. And... Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense that their society would mimic the hierarchy of the Nine Hells in a way, um, even though they have that demonic, chaotic nature bubbling away underneath the surface. It mainly manifests itself as battle rage and not so much a subversion of all lawful traits in them anymore. So, yeah, you could say that they've, they've basically bred the chaos out of them and uh, they do it kind of brutally. So... The society of the um, the Minotaurs on these islands, they have taken to uh, na- their natural knack of navigation, 
their ability to find their way back or or path any path that they've been through before they they know the way so they are unnerving navigators as sailors which gives them a huge advantage as an ocean-born race as uh, raiders of the sea because they they believe that they are they are mighty and might makes right so um if i can borrow something else any of you who are familiar with the uh, the Game of Thrones series and the Iron Islands, the uh, the Iron Price for things and um, the the house which does their seawall raiding, uh, the Greyjoys. This is the same principle. They they believe that um, one can earn something by paying the Iron Price for it by killing somebody for it, and they although they do engage in some trade, they also do a lot of raiding as well, and there is a nice comfortable spot that you can slide them just perfectly into it because there is islands in the forgotten realms i'll just cover some of these places on the map here where um, it is long been established that this is a pirate kingdom these are pirate islands that pirates come from and it's easy to slip in uh, the minotaurs as a pirate society which comes from this place, which have got, they're kind of like, you know, the uh, the Grey Joys. They're kind of like uh, a Roman state. They're kind of like a hobgoblin force. Um, they're not exactly like the Goliaths. They're not exactly like the Dragonborn. They are a distinct and interesting variant that you can slip into the game. So they don't really subvert anything else. They are an, they're an extra facet to the game. They're an extra type of monstrous creature that you can slide in there. And... Of course, having a stable society that they've come from or having a society where their ships may wreck on coasts, they may get into combats and fights and things where individuals are stranded long way from home, means that individuals may settle outside of their culture and they may have offspring and these these individuals may be raised amongst other societies. So you have that ability to have adventurers with a wide and variant array of different backgrounds. Now, the interesting thing is, and one thing that I really like with the Kryn version of the player character, is uh, so they've got an increased strength score of one. So you increase their strength score by one, but you get to choose whether to increase uh, another one of three virtues, strength, cunning, or intellect. Your choice of strength, intelligence, or wisdom score increases by one. So you can increase your strength by two, be truly uh, powerful or your increase with your wisdom or increase your intelligence because um, the minotaurs have have turned away from savagery and uh, embraced learning and wisdom they are adults about the age of 17 can live up to 150 years they have a strict code of honor which tends toward a lawful alignment but as i say they're um, they're loyal to the death and make them uh, very nasty enemies who will um, certainly pursue a grudge but they also make a great friend a loyal friend and they are not swift to form friendships with somebody because they are so honor bound in their friendships with others uh, because you know um, they will keep, they will fight and kill for a friend um, murdering somebody else is is something which is part of their society part of their culture and something that comes naturally easy to them um, slipping into a murderous, monstrous rage is something that, um, yeah, it's all too easy for them, I should say. They, uh, the non-monstrous versions are about six feet tall, weigh about 300 pounds. Their size is medium. Their base walking speed is 30 feet for these ones, although I've got no problem with it, you bumping it up to 40 feet. I mean, why not? Um, they are pretty stable on their feet. They are, they come from a maritime nation, so they're they're pretty good to... Uh, used to a rocking deck they don't wear footwear obviously they have hooves their horns um, give them a the monstrous ones have horns that do uh, 2d 2d 12 damage the non-monstrous ones have got slimmer uh, less bestial horns that do 1d8 damage piercing and they grant them advantage on all checks made to shove a creature but they don't knock a creature prone. Even when they do a dash action and then make a melee attack with the horns, um, they, yeah, you can use your dash action and make a melee attack with the horns. And they've got this feature called hammering horns. When you use an attack action during your turn to make an melee attack, you can attempt to shove a creature with your horns as a bonus action. 
So they could be attacking with a weapon and still, woof, hit somebody with their horns. Can't do this shove attack to uh, knock a creature prone, but you can certainly knock them back. Uh, they And of course they've got that perfect recall for any path that they've travelled. This includes dungeons. So they are great adventurers because they unerringly, unerringly find their way out, out of ways that they've been. And they can instantly tell when a dungeon, say, a wall has shifted or something like that. And the geography of the dungeon has, has changed from when they passed through it before. So they've got that great recall. And as a sea reaver, if they are actually sea reavers, they gain proficiency with navigator tool and water vehicles. So they can sail and use um, a sextant and things like that. And they speak common. Um, they don't have a, a minotaur language per se, and their culture is relatively young um, for the Forgotten Realms. Their names, originally, uh, their naming traditions um, are based on the Kryn. So they had two islands um, in Kryn. I won't go into great detail on uh, the background of the Kryn um, minotaurs, because it's very specific to the two islands there and if you're interested in that sort of thing I'm sure there's wikis and things like that for you but I mainly concentrate on Toril so forgive me um, yeah although the Dragonlance setting is great um, and information on, on that that stuff is really good it's a little bit dated now um, and I'm not I'm if you are a, a, a keen player of Dragonlance setting and Kryn please let me know um, and uh, if you've got any requests for that sort of information, otherwise I'm just going to assume that most people are playing Forgotten Realms setting stuff or playing their homebrew um, campaigns and Kryn is not high on your agenda. Uh, yeah, so honour. For all their cruelty, they are bound by a powerful sense of honour. So um, defeat in combat uh, is very bad in this society. Defeat in any sort of combat is very bad for a Minotaur. Both personally, their psyche suffers greatly for it. They, they, they suffer a great lack of confidence. They may fly into a rage. They may um, be expelled from their society. Uh, they may have to take lesser positions or not get the positions that they're best suited for. Uh, so you may have a brilliant minotaur who just happens to be bad at combat. And they will never get ahead in their society. It's just the way they are, unfair as it is. So you can have particularly talented Minotaurs who have a natural talent for magic or the clerical arts or, um, say, use of a bow or, or ranged weapons and things, and they just don't get ahead in Minotaur society because of the damn reliance on fighting to attain any sort of position, one-on-one -on -one combat. And so their combat is very ritualized. They may be a lot like the Fremen from Dune in that they carry a ritual combat weapon. Although typically, I mean, the majority of artwork you see of minotaurs and prevalent in their culture and on all aspects, they love great axes. Uh, battle axes and great axes tend to, to be their weapon of choice for various obvious reasons. If you've got great strength, it's a fantastic weapon. Um, very versatile. It's also a tool that's very uh, handy. I mean, it, it basically is an axe. So, yeah, and uh, you can use them all the time. And they are pretty handy on a, a ship as well for cutting cutting lines and riggings and splicing, uh, slicing up rope and um, chopping planks and that sort of thing. So, yeah, makes sense. Now, uh, the, the Minotaurs of Kryn believe that they are destined to conquer the world. And there's no reason why seaborn raiders of the Forgotten Realms wouldn't also have a similar sort of philosophy. And they may be a relatively recent... Uh, addition to the Forgotten Realms post-Spell Plague. Um, one of the things that got pointed out to me uh, recently um, when I was talking about the gnomes and the island of Lantern being destroyed, uh, the gnomes have actually come back. Um, I just read in the, the Sword Coast Guide, uh, Adventurer's Guide, um, and thank you very much to the viewer who uh, pointed this out to me, that the, the gnomes of the population of Lantern has actually come back, but I suspect that the island has actually been devastated and they've just dug up a bunch of uh, the shield golems and things like that that they had in storage that managed to survive the deluge and they've been trading them along the Sword Coast uh, at various different locations in exchange for raw materials rather than gold and gems and things. And also they've been seen to be trading strange gold coins with unusual markings on them and weird alien crystals, exotic crystals from some other realm. So it seems that some magic transported the, uh, the gnomes to some other land where 
uh, they survived for a hundred years and then the majority of the population came back grim dour a little bit worse for wear but determined to rebuild the islands of lantern now if you wanted to piece the two together you could say that they were transported to the islands some island in crin perfectly reasonable why not and when they came back minotaurs came with them that's perfectly reasonable as well so yeah, you can slot them in anywhere if, if you so choose i mean i don't see why not okay so that's basically it for the you know there's also if you want to look up the um the unearthed arcana stuff on the minotaurs they've also got some really good resources for the mariner fighting style uh, mariners as a feat the uh, roguish swashbuckler archetype and um, they've also got some additional random roll table for bonds that you can uh, apply to your uh, minotaur so um, for those who claim the exiles or those who survived a shipwreck or those who were part of a raiding party that got defeated and enslaved um, yeah or those who just don't share their love of violence that uh, is common to their race now um the what the other interesting thing is that the the minotaurs all minotaurs are tied into baphomet the uh the demon prince of the maze and uh, i have information on baphomet um from uh the dragon 369 from the dynamic demon nomicon of igwilv and uh, he's known as the prince of beasts and theologians and philosophers claim mortals are a threefold union of essences held in a harmonious balance and essentially baphomet is all about unleashing your bestial side unleashing the savage within you and um the thrill of destruction the appetite that all creatures seem to have for destruction at times particularly intelligent races and that's that's really his inroad into getting influence on the mortal plane and using it to destroy it so conquering creating a conquering race like the minotaurs for instance uh plays in perfectly with destabilizing destroying society so um it, it makes it easier for demons to invade and take over and destroy everything if there's no civilized society to stand against them um so it's a it's a long play really and although baphomet's got real world roots um it's first of it, his first appearance in dungeons and dragons was in 1982's uh, adventure module number 54 the lost caverns of sojanth and the second block like the module revealed the mutual hatred of baphomet and yenogu as legendary and each thrives to overthrow the other so minotaurs will naturally i think probably instinctually hate gnolls and and kill them on sight even civilized ones will have an unreasonable hatred of gnolls as their blood boils uh, when they see them so that's kind of interesting and uh the the maze the uh, labyrinth the manual plans presents the uh, baphomet's layer um this is from 1987's manual of the plains he lives at the center of an infinite maze that spans his layer and the layers adjacent to him the maze is said to change as it passes between the layers and is rumored to be populated by all manner of minotaurs some of whom have breath weapons and magical abilities uh so they are truly fearsome monstrous giant uh, demon infused minotaurs of legend and as with every other figure of the abyss and the nine hells baphomet vanished when the second edition of advanced Dungeons and dragons game it wasn't um well because of you know the 1980s and the uh, the whole satanic panic thing and it wasn't until 1992 that baphomet returned this time as one of the interloper gods who insinuated themselves into the giantess pantheon and uh he was risen was a risen tanari lord who exploited minotaurs seducing them to into service for the gods of god of the giants to serve their machinations against the ancient rival and enemy yenogu so and then we passed into third edition rules where we he got mentioned in the monster compendium uh monsters of Freyrune, uh uh the gao demon entry where buffermet is described as an abyssal lord and aside from this reference the horn king didn't receive much attention much attention until the denomicon of uh eagle weave um uh article baphomet and dragon magazine dragon magazine 341 uh enshrining the prince of beasts alongside other famed and dreaded demon princes uh and yeah 
The Codex, Fiendish Codex 1, Hordes of the Abyss, told us that Baphomet shares his abyssal layer with a potent and ancient fiend lord named Pale Knight. More imp- So, as I mentioned in Pale Knight's video, Baphomet's on the outside of the citadel of Pale Knight, who is in a small realm inside of the great and infinite maze. And Baphomet, wisely, I think, um, avoids interaction with Pale Knight as much as possible. Uh, she's basically in charge um, and Baphomet uh, yeah so he and within that that um, that chaos of the 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 lands of the, the great maze and stuff is this sort of savage beast land where um, the predatory nature of everything is just ramped up to 11 the dial is set to 11 constantly and everything is just tearing itself apart all the time and it's just a lethal environment to be in but um, yeah and, and this is the ultimate um cause this is the ultimate goal of baphomet on the mortal planes that he has influence in is just to ramp up the aggression and violence and savagery of everything um, up to 11 and minotaurs are his agents in the material plane through cult activity and that's really what their origin was so they have that dual nature but um civilized minotaurs i guess present you with a, a ray of hope really that the the sort of savagery can be bred out of um, a species but again it sort of lurks at the heart of them so that's about it for um the the minotaurs thanks very much for the suggestion everybody i, I know it's been bumped up on the the monster list um i hope that was satisfactory for you and uh yeah do check out those articles and things and uh, I'll post some links to um, the Wikipedia articles and things like that that cover the minotaurs or amazingly the savage minotaurs um, and I'll try and track down the unearthed arcana stuff so you can um, view it as well and I'll be back again fairly soon with another explores series and more monster ecology videos they'll keep coming until I just die of exhaustion I don't know thanks for listening everybody I'll catch you again soon